We're live. My guest today is Budi Anli, CEO at Blockless. Blockless is the infrastructure platform to launch, integrate, and secure networks and applications at unprecedented speeds. In today's conversations, we'll discuss the modular application architecture, randomized node orchestration, dynamic consensus, scalability of general computing, and building ZK verifiable application. I'm also dying to find out why she thinks applications shouldn't use one consensus and verification method, but should assemble from all of them. Before we get started, make sure to hit the like button, hit the notification bell, and subscribe to get notified when I go live every week. And remember that none of what we discuss here on the Interop is investment advice. And if you enjoy this content, please consider sticking with us. We're validating on Evmos, Quicksilver, Osmosis, Juno, and Nolus. Just look for Interop in the active set. My guest, Butian, is coming up next right here on the interop. Hey, hey, how's it going? Hey, Sip, good. How are you? Really, really great. I'm really glad we can finally do this. Uh, we've been talking for several months now, and I'm happy that I can finally get you on the podcast. Um, but yeah, before we get started, I uh, wanted to ask you, how has been your uh, your EU trip so far? I know you were at ETC and Nebula Summit and uh, traveling through Europe, I think, for the first time. So how's that experience been? Yeah, it's amazing. I'm seriously considering moving to Europe. I'm currently in Liège still recovering from the craze of all those great events, um, Nebula Summit, um, ETH CC, and everything has been amazing. Um, yeah, can't wait to, you know, hit the road again, maybe sometime later <laughs> this month to go back home and then wrap yeah. up things and move over at some point. Well, cool. Yeah. Been I, I feel like there were a lot of people at, uh, at, at ETH CC this year. I, I don't know why, but like weeks before ETC, you know, like there were this civil, un there was a civil unrest in France and a lot of people were like fighting France and, and, uh, and then everybody got here and they're like, things are amazing. I love this place. I want to move here. <laughs> and so it was, it was kind of like interesting uh, to see the contrast, but um, yeah, so this is actually like the, the, the first post nebular episode. Um, so um, yeah. What did you think of the conference? Uh, maybe uh, uh, FOMOing those who missed it. <laughs> Yes, for sure. It, um, I have to say it's one of the best. Um, you are always surprised by the sheer amount of energy and technical expertise um, that builders, especially in the Cosmo ecosystem, I think it's the, one of the highest grade of uh, builders that you can find. And it's really great for us to be part of it and share all the um, thoughts and hearing what other innovations been going on in the industry. Yeah, yeah, and it, it it was funny just like the day after Nebular, the you know we all we all left Nebula super energized and like there was lots of great people there, all kinds of new ideas, great conversations. Like the whole ecosystem showed up, and everybody was super pumped after even after like ten days of ETC. And then like the next day, this Coinbase article comes out, kind of like flooding the whole space, and uh, yeah, it was just like, well, where is this happening? I mean, where or like the sentiment really didn't uh, sort of echo for me, I think uh, generally like at Nebula and all the other interchain Cosmos events that happened during ECC. So, so somewhere yeah. someone's not getting the memo. I, I got a suggestion actually, uh, if you would like to consider running Nebula elsewhere across the globe as well, just like how, you know, we got ECC and um, other like um, Berlin, et cetera. So, if you are considering of taking it to the US, maybe um, I can help you out there. It's just great energy and I feel it doesn't do its justice to be only hosting in uh, Europe. Yeah, yeah, like this is definitely something we're, we're thinking about. So we, we had one experience with a side event in, uh, in Medellin uh, during Cosmoverse and you know, I mentioned at the end of of, uh, of Nebula this year that we'll definitely do a side event at Cosmoverse, and we'll probably do other side events like during big conferences. Um, but yeah, like everything is kind of in flux right now. We're still 
we're still kind of strategizing after this event, you know, and like thinking about what we want to do with it and where we want to take it. But I think, yeah, there's definitely an opportunity to do more of these and uh, yeah. And, 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 and build out this event as something that, you know, is a broad, like a much bigger community of people. And there's, you know, and, you know, I don't want to make this whole thing about Nebula, but there, there's one thing that I think I took away from Nebula is, uh, and, and something that I want to really make um, kind of an intro, integral part of the conference of the conference is I, I want to make it such that like you have all of these really smart people like building cool tech and like interested in in in, in blockchains and crypto and have uh, also like artists be integrated into the conference in some respect. So we had this like, graffiti artist that was there during the event. He did the artwork for the uh, for the T-shirt. And then we auctioned off like this, this, the photo that was sort of like the GIF of this NFT, uh, sorry, the GIF of this art, right. That he did, that was just kind of like the progression of the art and we auctioned it off on stargaze and we made like, we auctioned it for like two grand in the end. Uh, and, and, and that was going to go to charity. So like, I, I felt like that really, um, created a really cool experience for people to see that art being made throughout the conference. And then like, you know, the, the final, you know, the final act of that is that we get to help like all these kids with diabetes. Right. And, and, um, and I think that that's something that I want, I want to try to like keep within the conference is like also art and like maybe doing good and, you know, so yeah, lots of ideas, uh, that, that came out of this year's event. So, um, yeah, let's talk a little bit of your background and how you, um, how you got to be interested in, uh, working on, decentralized compute and, uh, and, and, and founding Blockless. Yeah. So my background, um, started well in crypto back in 2017, started working really, uh, real world asset project, but back in the day, um, that isn't even a thing. Um, been building really, um, taking that project off the ground and to scaling really over 10 million GMB per year. Um, and then, we later got listed on exchanges like Binance, et cetera. That was a wild ride, but um, because there's like all kinds of government regulations and everything, it's super anti-crypto. Um, so, but that makes me really want to, you know, um, see what in the world where, you know, the entire blockchain really fit in. Um, so I went back to school and as I was scouting deals for um, NGC Ventures, um, I came to learn about this cool project, uh, which um, now my co-founder actually, Derek, um, he was building, um, he got this idea because of a Twitter thread that has been uh, brought into a lot of discussion into sharing a decentralized network for doing general computation to support such as DAX um, or aggregations of DAX and other kind of uh, computations that is pos impossible to run on chain. And um, as I started really helping Derek out more and more, um, I, at the end, as a result, I invested myself out loud to helping Derek to build now Blockless. Yeah, um, he uh, came from distributed cloud space even before crypto. Um, and back then, you know, he was working at Akash leading the one of the biggest uh, distributed uh, cloud platform. And he later find out that with a web assembly technology, uh, the industry can see really a secure runtime that's like closer to like a TEE um, in terms of, um, you know, agent computing. And he was leveraging uh, the web, web assembly technology to build now uh, Blockless. Yeah, that's cool. I, I've talked to Derek and he's got really an impressive background. And, uh, you know, when when we first started talking, it just it, it made so much sense to me and, and it still does. Right. Like that you you have this um, like uh, Akash. It, I mean, Blockless to me feels like an evolution of the Akash idea that's a lot more specialized and and um, and and potentially quite impactful in the in the Web3 stack Because like Akash is. Uh, this marketplace for um, for well, essentially like server architecture, right? So it's it's quite generalized. So they're they're doing like you, you can deploy like Docker containers there, but they also want to get into the GPU market. 
but but blockless really addresses the issue of like computation like off-chain computation and, and verifiable off-chain computations as well and of course in in decentralized applications that has like a lot of of use cases you know it, but for me it's still it's a little bit fuzzy where blockless sits in the stack right like um and maybe because that's also because the stack is is evolving and the narratives around the stack are 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 are, are becoming clearer. But um, yeah, talk a little bit about you know the the modular stack. You know, we know I think like what the layers are there, right? Like we have consensus as the A, and then we have settlement and execution. Um, and of course, we can go more granular within each of those layers, but. Where does uh, blockless sit, and you know, typically, to whom would it be a um, a, a client, or who, what what layer of the stack would it be serving specifically? Yeah, I think that's a definitely a fair question. As a matter of fact, when I go around talking to crypto people about what Blockless is doing, you know, the kind of unsaid assumption is that you would be talking about something that happens on chain. Um, what we realized that we talk so much about modularity, but it's confined to modular blockchain. Uh, but what I think is kind of like um, doesn't really make make much sense is modular blockchain itself um, is actually not so modular. Um, well, the reason is basically in a modular blockchain architecture, right? Um, each task um, they should be specifically per, uh, they should be specifically performed by each layer. Um, and uh, the remaining task, you know, can be taken care to offload to other layers, right? So there are commonly known um, different layers, as you mentioned, um, DA, settlement, um, or execution, which is really an abstraction of sequencing and smart contract um, layers. But um, actually, there are more fundamental things uh, level below what we talked about um, that we almost take for granted like how we breathe the air without even knowing the existence of it, um, such as uh, P2P network layer, consensus layer, and of course, um, the security layer, right? So uh, the idea of modular blockchain is um, different layers can be replaced and altered independently, but this is not really the case um, in practice. For example, like uh, we noticed that um, in IBC, for example, um, if you want two IBC compatible chains to you know, perform certain tasks, form a bridge, uh, they have to rely on the underlying relayer or operators to, for, to perform this predefined uh, task according to the rules, right? But the node uh, may fall short um, or they even fell off due to, you know, misalignment and uh, economic incentives. Um, there's a data point, I think uh, I once read, there are like almost 40% of the Cosmo operators uh, they quit due to insufficient um, incentives over time. So majority of the um, Cosmos operator, for example, uh, they're running, you know, um, those uh, projects that can um, bring them um, enough profit, such as Juno, Osmosis, or Secret Network, um, just to name a few of those big players out there. Um, However, yeah, and, um, and validating it, on the, all of those chains is not always profitable. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> so I, not even that. And like, think about it for the smaller uh, players, you know, they have to overcome the co-start problem. You know, uh, they have to just compete with those uh, across the entire proof of Cosmos operators, right? Um, so, um, you know, this is like not so um, strictly isolated, the problem uh, using modularity, right? Um, so it's easy for um, like people to build the stack, but without having it actually works. I remember um, ICS29 um, was part of the initiative to just introduce the relayer and middle work, um, middleware um, economic to revamp the landscape for, uh, for the operators. So those are the kind of problems that we see with, within the modular stack, right? So, um, that really like kind of starts the um, where we are building. It's like the question uh, we're asking: Hey, is it really possible for you know all the uh, applications that build across this modular architecture to remove the economic uh, dependencies and still you know um, have a much uh, broader flexibility and room for 
uh, creation of the um, innovation of the, to address those um, use cases um, that the customers would need. Okay, so, but that but that doesn't really answer the. My, my, I mean, that, that's all very interesting, and uh, <laughs> but that but that doesn't really answer the question of like where Blockless sits in the stack. And um, I mean, maybe can we talk about like a, a use case specifically? So, like, give an example of an application um, that would be using Blockless and the, the types of computations that you know it might want to outsource the block list because those computations are not efficient or are too costly to run on um, on a you know run of the mill blockchain mm -hmm. yeah so I think like the, the, the kind of the um, conclusion from uh, the previous explanation is that uh, you can achieve um, decentralized application or network uh, by combining the on-chain and off-chain components. And to give you an example why this is uh, the case, um, for example, like w uh, some of our customers are running um, AI uh, marketplace or uh, those kind of application that requires um, intensive computing. Um, mm -hmm. It's not something that you can run on chain, right? However, you still wanna uh, make it um, trustless in a manner where uh, a variety of parties um, that comes from a conflict of interest, uh, they would need to deal with each other and have the transparency and sometimes the privacy even preserved for such kind of um, interactions. So um, Blockless essentially fit in as the uh, full stack decentralization solution that works hand in hand with those uh, layer ones. Um, so together we're able to achieve a full stack decentralization uh, for our AI clients. They run uh, their own decentralized network that's built using the blockless uh, infrastructure to provide um, trustless uh, computation, running those AI libraries, running LLM inference models, and um, also to have the clients to have um, to give them the control of their uh, data by running um, some of those uh, privacy preserved. Uh, functionalities, uh, leveraging our uh, ZK technology. And altogether, we provide a much more performant um, network that's tailored to the client's need. Okay, so if I'm, I'm trying to like paint a picture of um, um, a chain that might want to leverage blockless, so um, would would it would would an application be able to leverage blockless to create say um something like a proprietary oracle so let's say you, like you have a blockchain there's transaction data happening there um that application might want to provide uh to its users um some some ver like some some pr uh, version of that data that's been processed right and you might there's different ways one might do that. You know, typically, uh, for a long time, the way that's been done is that um, the, the teams will actually run server infrastructure, like centralized server infrastructure, where they'll be aggregating that blockchain data, transforming the data, providing it as a as an API. Essentially, um, would, would would that use case be formidable in the in the case of Blockless, where the the chain could uh, leverage Blockless to do that data transformation, do it in a way that's verifiable? Where the community and the users know that that data has been properly tra uh, uh, transformed, and then serving it back to the applications. Mm -hmm. I think that's a one example, and um, it actually touches upon two things. One is the Oracle functionality, right, and the other is the need for an application, which in itself is not an Oracle, but um, it leverages the Oracle's data feed. Uh, to fulfill its um, trading or um, its uh, platform um, needs. So this is really one classic example of how you would need both on-chain and off-chain components and a combination of different uh, consensus to work all together uh, to provide this kind of service, let's say if it's just for a DAX, right? So kind of walking through how this entirety um, of the workflow would, um, you know, um, would run basically. Uh, let's say if like 
I'm I'm like simply running a DAX, right? And I would need a quorum of, of nodes to retrieve the price data for let's say just like a ETH uh, BTC trading pair, right? And this um, is it forms like a simple data aggregation consensus, right? And this could be just like a third party oracle or a decentralized nodes uh, that are performing this task. Um, this is just like one commonly known feature provided by Oracle, uh, but uh, which can actually be taken care of by any application if they have the access um, to, you know, um, to use uh, the decentralized node and define their business logic. So um, if we perform the transaction, right, and involves a ray layer network, maybe some crossing bridges in the middle, right, they form, you know, the, um, uh, they transact the assets. And for this part, you would probably need uh, maybe a different set of nodes and perform a different set of um, ver verification or consensus. Could be like BFT or the classic, you know, uh, CK snark proof if you just require one node to perform a certain task. And then once the transaction is gone through, the finality settlement is done on a layer one or layer two level, right? Um, this is taken care by the, the smart contract or the blockchain. And by integrating into those smart contract or the layer one, or even just uh, the data availability layer, right? Uh, the entire workflow um, is uh, run seamlessly um, by combining the different building blocks uh, from both on-chain and the off-chain world. So I mentioned at the top of the show that your hot take was that you, know, you thought applications shouldn't use one consensus, but they should assemble all of them. And you kind of hinted here that applications should use multiple uh, consensus and verification methods. Uh, can you unpack that and explain what that means practically and why you think that's the case? Yeah, um, I think like it just doesn't make sense for any application to live on a single blockchain. Um, just like how, you know, if we describe there's like a very uh, commonly known analogy of each eco, uh, layer one ecosystem is kind of like a nation, right? Um, if you are to achieve mass adoption, you got to operate internationally, right? So um, you got to do either <clears throat> have certain um, uh, components that operate cross chain um, or like um, operate with the um, off chain so that, uh, you know, the, the data, the computation um, talk to each other, right? So that's like the building off that um, assumption, right? If we believe that's the case, then um, of course the constraint uh, or the bottleneck would happen where you have to conform uh, the consensus that's only provided by such layer one, right? And um, that would be the biggest building, uh, the biggest roadblock you would run into. Um, there are a couple of ways to solve uh, this problem. Uh, one is that, you know, the simplest way is kind of going back to the, uh, the cross-chain DAX um, analogy, right? Um, you could run a centralized bridge so that you avoid participating in um, a layer one consensus uh, to fulfill your application needs. Um, that actually works uh, very well for, say for example, uh, Binance Pack um, cross-chain bridge or USDC. Um, but it's not often the case for other <clears throat> applications or networks uh, especially those that don't come with this authority in themselves, um, like in the example that we mentioned or for our clients, right, who want to just run a marketplace. Um, so in this kind of cases, um, the decentralized solution comes down to ultimately solving, um, you know, the, um, the execution um, and the trust that you build, leveraging uh, the decentralized uh, uh, a node or validators. And um, this is just like one, uh, like one example that comes all together as to explain why, uh, you know, having multiple consensus at your disposal where you can break uh, your stack down into which part is more suitable uh, for running which kind of verification or uh, consensus mechanism um, is a more efficient way uh, to approach the modern decentralized applications that uh, operate as like an international um, company. Do you think this, this I mean, th does this idea kind of play into the, the mesh security idea a little bit where like an application 
leverages multiple con consensus and verification methods or or is that kind of a lower layer because I, I guess like this idea of an application leveraging multiple consensus is you know like deploying your application to multiple chains and like in the context of cosmos that would be like deploying an, an outpost you know to another chain whereas um mesh security is more about like chain securing each other. These are these are two different concepts, right? But I, I don't know if they're related somehow. Mm -hmm. um, I'd say is that um, it's more about uh, breaking things down and decoupling um, things, right? Where um, we still have the settlement taken care of on the layer one level. That's the global ledger uh, level of consensus, right? Um, but for those uh, mutable operations, right? Um, you don't need uh, kind of a historical ledger to uh, record everything that happens, right? Uh, for that kind of particular um, functionality, right? Um, it may just be more suitable to run just a ZK snark where one node can do the job without letting the rest of the nodes uh, across the network to know what they're actually um, up to. So let's talk a little bit about the, um, the, the technical aspects of blockless so um can, can you describe the network topology i mean um right should we think of blockless as as a blockchain that is like a layer one blockchain that is orchestrating these different resources um yeah and, and like in that perspective what is the role of you know consensus and the different um the the, the validators are mm -hmm. are the validators sort of different from you know, the the uh, the computation um, those who are running computations etc so yeah talk about the network architecture and also the different participants in, in the network yeah sure so uh, to start off um, right uh, you're right in saying that uh, blockless kind of um, orchestrate the task and um, the hardware node resources right uh, but instead of doing it in kind of a chain fashion right uh, we basically run this algorithm uh, that we call randomized uh, node orchestration. And uh, we actually initially run that as um, our own uh, Cosmo-based chain. Uh, but later, uh, we realized that uh, we can actually gain a more scalability by just having that uh, orchestration algorithm um, or functionality taken care on the network level without even having a chain. And what that does is essentially allocating the most suitable nodes uh, to run any kind of um, arbitrary task that comes into the network. That's like, just are be like, they might just be like, hey, like, you know, um, I'm an application, I need uh, five nodes uh, to run this um, Oracle um, module, for example. And then across the network, we do a roll call and the most suitable nodes, considering their hardware uh, capacity and also uh, the um, reputation of the nodes according to an ELO score ranking. And then we do a randomized selection of the nodes to pick up that task. Um, Sorry, what's an ELO score ranking? Yeah, so that's basically like in sports where people used to um, have a holistic view of like how good a player, in this case, is like how the node is considering their historical performances. And um, simply take it as like a reputation mechanism that we know we have transparency into uh, how, what's the quality of the node essentially. And um, so the orchestration, uh, because it's randomized, so it enhances the security by, um, you know, um, to protect it from civil attacks, for example. Um, this is the case because um, unlike how blockchain works, right? The nodes, they don't have much of choice of which task to execute. Uh, they only conform to the consensus um, because the result of not doing that would, um, you know, uh, would uh, incur a forking, right? So. Uh, the node, however, within the blocks network, um, they are um, orchestrated to pick up the task without knowing what they are running or what they are going to run. So that's a base layer of uh, security. And 
Um, on top of that, you know, the um, network or application um, during the build phase to specify the instructions, basically a set of rules, the business logic, uh, what are the nodes um, responsibilities are, right? And um, those nodes, uh, they perform the task according to the set of instructions. And um, the most common result of it is to either aggregate the result or submit, in the case of CK Snark proof um, module, they submit the result together with a proof to an on-chain endpoint or um, like a layer one uh, verifier smart contract. And on the layer one, um, the results get either validated or accepted uh, to form the finality um, of uh, when the block comes out. So this is kind of like a full cycle of um, an execution task that happens um, with the with the block list and the coordination to the layer one chain. Okay, so so there there is no like blockless doesn't have its own layer one blockchain. I think we so we've established that, right? Yeah. Right, and so instead, um, blockless deployments orchestrate the resource allocation to um, different execution nodes that are part of the blockless network. Is that is that correct? Right. That's okay. right. So, and just so, like so the one blockless network. So, mm -hmm. Sorry, but that just to finalize that thought. So like the blockless network is not actually a network of chains. It is a network of deployments. And uh, block. Mm -hmm. yeah, sorry, go ahead. Oh yeah. Um, I was going to say blockless network. Um, it is um, a network of nodes and the network of uh, standards established uh, by this um, secure runtime. So, um, so that any task can be consistently executed, no matter which is the node that pick up the job. Okay, but how does it like so? So this is this is where it's unclear. Like, how do the nodes communicate with each other, and like, what is the what what is the like the the central point of of orchestration, right? Like, how does one inter? Like, let's say I want to interact like leverage blockless where am i interacting with blockless am i interacting with blockless sort of on my let's say i'm an application on you know archway i'm, I'm interacting with the blockless contract on archway and if i'm on evmos i'm interacting with the blockless contract on evmos and then that uh and then so that that's one thing and then the other thing is how do the um how do the execution nodes know to communicate with those different deployments yeah, so um, the short answer is that we have a base layer lib P2P that manages the communication uh, between nodes. Yeah, think of okay. that as just like, yeah, a standard P2P network. And then okay. um, in terms of the um, communication with the uh, smart contract or layer one chain, or let's say just like any um, an, um, Cosmos um, IBC chain, right? Um, the endpoint of the, so the, the node, um, from the blockless network communicate uh, with the um, endpoint of the smart contract. So this is like similar to how any RPC node would work. Um, this is not something that we build, you know, as like anything new to the industry. It's basically leveraging the existing capabilities um, of how the uh, smart contract and uh, blockchain work in terms of how they have the nodes where um, you can run a light node or a full node for uh, either read or read write uh, functionalities to the blockchain okay, itself. Yeah. yeah, of course. Okay, interesting. And so, um, I want to talk a little bit more about this um, this resource allocation process. So, as an application, I want to offload some of my computation to to blockless. Let's say I'm like a DEX on, let's use Archway as an example. Uh, I want to have a blockless do some some compute on the data that my DEX is is um, uh, is producing. Um, that that 
interaction between those two contracts might happen over an IBC connection, I suppose. Um, and then um, Blockless then uh, transmits, say, like this this computation requirement or this VM um, or this, this 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 payload to nodes on the blockless network to pick up that computation. Can, can you go a little bit more in detail about why, um, uh, why, oh, sorry, my camera just dropped, but yeah, essentially uh, how um, that process of choosing the nodes uh, happens. Sure. Yeah. I also see there's uh, no signal sign. Yeah. On your... Yeah. Yeah. I, I need yeah. a new camera. Um... <laughs> So the, um, for kind of a application um, or like, let's say a network uh, that leverages uh, blockless. Um, I think in your example, it involves like cross chain operations. Uh, might be some uh, complexities in that, but if we were just to reduce that into a minimum set of requirements, say a simple uh, like single chain um, application, right? Um, it, um, it has the, um, let's say it has the, um, the business logic defined in, and implemented both in um, on-chain as part of the smart contract, right? And um, also the, the set of uh, the uh, computation that's written um, in like for coordinating, you know, the um, either like say that being, um, a decentralized uh, data caching, um, for example. Um, like, I, I think it's um, probably easier if we just like use a concrete example. Um, some of the blockless customers, yeah, they are, awesome. yeah. So they are using blockless as the um, compute engine for game rendering. Um, because, you know, the, you know, it's often this uh, big problem where uh, fully on-chain games, um, they suck in experience. Whereas uh, if you don't put the game on-chain, um, you kind of have the centralization risk, right? So um, these days we see a lot of people actually do, uh, looking into building a full stack decentralized application. At the same time, they want um, better user experience, uh, similar to um, a Web2 game. So um, in this case, right, their um, assets are transacted on chain and it's the same smart contract, um, nothing has changed. Uh, whereas the option components, when it comes to um, the rendering or calculating the kind of um, like game map, for example, for a multiplayer game, or just like simple features as you're uh, playing like a poker game, right? Uh, it requires uh, verification of each of the steps, right? And uh, they use Blockless as to fulfill this anti-cheat feature um, to make sure that um, even it involves um, no asset transactions, just like a kind of interim step within the game, right? You have every single um, action validated by this anti-cheat engine, and you make sure that it's a fair game is uh, decentralized, is the community that runs the game engine. Actually, there's no centralization risk for anyone, not even the team, the founders to cheat. And uh, the asset security is really uh, guaranteed as the, the final security safeguard by a layer one chain. So you really, uh, what the, the projects or the application gets is the ability to leverage an existing uh, layer one ecosystem uh, volume and the community traffic um, and without paying too much uh, for the rent for running everything on chain uh, that would incur not only just like expensive gas fees, but also high latencies uh, that ultimately wouldn't even make it possible to run the game engine. Yeah, in, in the conversation that we had um, you know, previously, and uh, mm -hmm. you, you mentioned that what was really cool about Blockless is that you know the um, that communities themselves could mm -hmm. essentially uh, uh, run Blockless infrastructure, right? So in, in the case of a game, 
you know, what would be anticipated or expected is that the, the players themselves that, you know, have, and especially in the case of Web3 game, right, where like players have assets and there's like, uh, they have a, a, an intrinsic um, uh, incentive to um, have the game be running and everything that sophisticated players uh, or members of the community could run blockless nodes and be running some of that infrastructure. And of course, because, and we'll get to this, we'll get to this in a few minutes, because it's verifiable, because it uses uh, ZK Wasm, you know, essentially like only one person could be doing this, right? Or like, you know, even like the company building the game could be running uh, this infrastructure. Now, of course, there there might be like a liveness risk by only having like one node, but um, uh, but you like basically uh, a few people in that in that ecosystem could be running infrastructure, and anybody could spin it up. And I think that's that's kind of cool because it also provides potentially. Um, means for you know those folks to make extra money um, through running this infrastructure. Um, so that brings me, I guess, to like my next question, which is, um, what what are the, the the liveness guarantees when utilizing blockless for an application? Are mm-hmm. the computations run you know on on multiple nodes so such that you know if any one node goes down, like another node will pick up or, or are the computations run simultaneously and sort of like provided uh, to to the application? Can you talk a little bit more about that? Sure. Yeah, I think you actually touched upon a couple of uh, important uh, concepts. Uh, the first one is the liveness of the uh, application or the network, for example. Um, with Blockless, you know, the uh, builders, uh, they can have the confidence that their application is up running 24-7. Uh, just because we have this uh, fault tolerance uh, or failover uh, built in and the fault tolerance. Basically, it w- what it means that is that, um, say, if just one node um, that uh, goes down, right, the next node would immediately come up uh, back online to pick up the task. And if in one node, they, excuse me, if in one node that they uh, mess up for some reasons, right, um, the, uh, it would not result into uh, the failure of the application. So for those kind of unexpected events, um, you know, builders, they can't have the confidence that their app is running um, even when those kind of uh, unexpected things happen. And uh, another thing is like really uh, kind of stepping out of the uh, realm of um, the technical failures that would possibly cause a system to go down, right? Uh, we actually have another set of uh, failures that we need to think of. Um, for example, like what we um, kind of talked about in the uh, Cosmos operators um, kind of problem is that, you know, if your nodes get, don't get um, incentivized that much, um, it's possible for like even a layer one to go down, right? Or it um, experience certain um, uh, attacks uh, that works against the advantage of their economic incentive, right? Uh, those are the kind of um, issues that we also try to uh, resolve uh, by leveraging the decentralized ecosystem, um, um, economic layer. And um, it's possible for even a project to fund a DAO to run, um, say, for example, their front end. So that way, you know, uh, you can make sure that even in the face of um, you know, censorship um, that would uh, pull down the, um, would tear down the, um, the website, uh, you still can have the community uh, run uh, front end uh, to guarantee the access and to make sure that uh, the application is up uh, running um, for those kind of extreme cases. Yeah. Okay. Then that, that's, that's pretty cool. Um, and I mean, I, I'd like to talk a little bit about the, um, the VM and like the, 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 mm-hmm. the, the aspect of Wasm here. So I think this is something that was really interesting to me when I first started chatting with you guys is, uh, the fact that you were using, um, Wasm instead of, um, say like Docker containers or, or something like that. And after speaking with Derek, what, what, what he explained were, were some things that I didn't really know about Wasm was that well, Wasm is actually pretty compact and efficient and the, the payloads are much smaller. And then there's this other thing that uh, we discussed that I, I didn't know about Wasm, which was that 
um, and I might be getting this wrong, but but Wasm, it's possible to predict the computational cost of a Wasm um, program, and that makes it really kind of mm -hmm. useful in the context of a blockchain where you have you know kind of like to figure out the cost, etc. So yeah, can you talk a little bit about the uh, about about Wasm generally and how it's used in in, in Blockless and some of the reasons why you chose to go down that path. Yeah, sure. So uh, a couple of advantages that comes with uh, WebAssembly or WASM and the WASI interface is that uh, first is, um, like you said, extremely uh, efficient and uh, portable. So a traditional like Docker image, let's say if it's like 200 megabytes in uh, WebAssembly uh, format, it could be like two megabytes. And um, WebAssembly as this low level uh, kind of binary um, instruction, they work across platform. So any device that can open up a web browser can technically run uh, a, a WASM based um, our uh, runtime node. And we're really talking about a cross platform from um, say running um, task on Android phone or uh, you know even um, at, on your laptop in Chrome or say uh, very performant institutional grade CPU, GPU, those kind of bare metals and servers. And it's consistent across different uh, devices. Um, so uh, at Blockless, we built a WebAssembly secure runtime and also an X86 emulator within the runtime for both uh, running you know, event-driven and continuous tasks. And the security that comes with WebAssembly is that um, is a secure sandbox environment uh, within the host machine, right? Uh, with the end-to-end -end encryption and um, MPC, um, currently we use um, HashiCore um, as part of the um, implementation. Um, also trying to integrate a uh, lit uh, later on, but all those um, combined together, we have a secure runtime. Even um, if you know the, you're the host machine owner, uh, you can't see whatsoever is running on your machine. And this runtime is like one instance, but replicated to each and every um, other hardware uh, to, made up, to make up this uh, really global um, edge computing network. And um, so building with all those, um, you know, um, the technologies, um, plus um, the uh, provision for hardware resource consumption, basically what it means is that uh, once a um, function or a task that comes into the system, uh, even prior to running that uh, task, um, we can provide an accurate uh, provision of how much of the um, hardware resource will be consumed and what is the requirements for the hardware. So that really allow us to be, um, I think the only um, provider there to be able to really orchestrate any task in a random fashion, considering the uh, hardware uh, resource consumption and the variety of the node um, out there. So with all those really, we allow um, like, you know, application or network to kind of uh, build once and then um, you know, go on an autopilot mode uh, to have the, um, the application running um, across uh, the network. Okay, no, that's really cool. And and um, and is is ZK Wasm are, are all applications running on Blockless automatically kind of privacy preserving, or is that something that applications choose to to deploy as? And is is deploying a, a Wasm application or a ZK Wasm application any different than just deploying a Wasm application? Or like for developers, what, what is the difference there? Yeah, from a developer's perspective, right, um, it is a combination. So you first uh, need to, of course, prepare all your code that has all your, um, all your logic. And you need to indicate which uh, verification or consensus mechanism is needed. So um, in the graphic interface that we provide for independent developers, um, it's really kind of pick and choose which one uh, for which function. 
and for our custom build solution, right? Um, it is, um, you know, the, you can have uh, the ZK or um, the, uh, uh, the other verification mechanism, um, you know, uh, if you select that, of course, for that part of the logic um, it uses, uh, now we currently integrate it with ZK WASM, uh, but there are a couple of other uh, ZK solutions that uh, we will later integrate as um, all provided as the um, options for developers to pick and choose whichever is more suitable for their particular application or network tailored needs. And yeah, so in short, it's, it's not like um, every single um, function or task is the same. It's really uh, like providing the flexibility um, for built developers to customize based on their need. And, and will you provide like um, sort of like an SDK for mm -hmm. application developers to interact with block lists? I mean, I guess there's like two layers, right? Yeah. Like one is like interacting with your application, leveraging in order to mm -hmm. leverage block lists. And then there's like the actual kind of computation or like program that you want the WASM VM to execute. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, yes, we have the SDK. Um, and I think it may be helpful to really um, introduce a bit about our product offering um, as it's a spectrum from custom built solution all the way to fully managed um, hands off um, serverless functions. So the first one, of course, um, with the SDK and everything, uh, there are more tailored, um, you know, logic built in and requirements that uh, oftentimes, you know, uh, we do with bigger uh, projects and clients. Uh, we together built those um, features, for example, when they require uh, privacy preserved features for running a particular uh, library that needs to be integrated within the blockless runtime, right? Uh, whereas for, you know, the um, fully managed um, hands-off serverless functions, right? Um, you have those, it, it, it's, less, um, it's less customization that you need to do. Uh, whereas there are more uh, templates that um, you can pick and choose and avoid building uh, from scratch. And through this approach, really um, the developers, they really just need to focus on, you know, um, the defining, you know, how they want the application to run and then uh, the rest is um, kind of offloaded to the network to um, the predefined um, instructions that's provided by Blockless to make sure that uh, their tasks are executed correctly and consistently across the network. Very cool. Um, yeah, let, let's talk a little bit about this 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 um, this random node orchestration aspect. Um, and, uh, yeah, how, how you, you do this, uh, this random orchestration. Um, yeah. So, um, when it comes to the random, uh, node orchestration, um, so we, uh, when one task that comes into the system, um, and, uh, there's like a roll call that happens, um, to recruit all the qualified nodes and based on the, uh, function or um, the ap application's requirements, uh, we select those, uh, the number of nodes fulfill the requirements and um, the task is retrieved from its uh, designated um, decentralized uh, storage. storage. Uh, we currently, we have the default of IPFS as storing those, uh, the code logic. And uh, the nodes, they go on execute. Um, the tasks and then uh, compile the result and send it back. Uh, the randomized orchestration means that each and every node, uh, the as long as fulfilling the hardware requirements would have the equal chance of being selected for a round of um, execution. So that not only guarantees the security, but also provide the fairness uh, for the network um, as to, you know, when um, at scale, right? Um, it's kind of like, this Uber platform, where as a driver, you can fairly anticipate and expect that uh, your car is busy all the time and you can make exactly based on the capacity of your car. Okay. And and so th there was something interesting you said. So you said 
that the payloads are stored on an IPFS. So basically like a node will look at a program, whether or not they, they're, a, whether or not they're able to execute it. But like, so that data, also the programs themselves are, uh, are hosted in a decentralized, uh, on a decentralized mm -hmm. network. Okay. Yes. Yes. So the, all those um, payload and everything, they are um, stored and retrieved in a decentralized uh, fashion. Um, to really avoid any centralized risk uh, that's introduced uh, into this entire system. As you know, like the degree of decentralization or the level of security is really determined by the lowest, uh, you know, the, the lowest um, uh, components with the um, any kind of risks. Cool. Um, well, I, I, I know we're cutting it a bit short, but I know you, you the office you're in right now is closing and, um, you, uh, you need to, to, to wrap up. Um, but yeah, yeah let's, let's, uh, maybe just finally, like, uh, where can people learn more about Blockless and give us a bit of a sense of, you know, the, the roadmap and, um, yeah, what's next for mm -hmm. you guys. Yeah, I think I can definitely share, um, uh, share the, uh, link tree that, uh, direct to all of our documentations, our uh, developer dashboard, and um, everything that you could uh, find uh, and want to find about uh, Blockless. And in terms of the roadmap, uh, you know, we are now, uh, I'd say, focused um, majority of the time and effort in supporting uh, our B2B clients. And um, we have a uh, running full self-servicing um, developer portal where for anyone, you know, um, really there's no uh, kind of barriers uh, to start coding and building using Blockless. Uh, we are extremely Web2 uh, developer friendly as well as um, any, essentially any um, WebAssembly based uh, uh, or WebAssembly compatible language. Um, you know, we have, uh, currently we have uh, support for Rust and Python that's coming uh, right away, I think, uh, as in the uh, next uh, week or two. And um, also um, in the future, we will also support um, more languages, um, including you know, C, JavaScript, et cetera. And um, on the roadmap, I think the, the biggest, uh, one of the biggest milestone uh, that comes up next is the launch, our, uh, the launch of our uh, public beta testnet that uh, will open up the uh, entire network for anyone that has, um, you know, a laptop or some piece of um, hardware to run a node. Um, also support, you know, uh, virtual node. And um, then after that is um, integrating more extensions and um, everything to, um, you know, um, go after the mainnet launch. Cool. Well, um, thanks so much for coming on. I learned a ton about uh, about Blockless today, and like really looking forward to learning more. And um, uh, also, uh, good luck with uh, the upcoming mainland launch. Yeah. Thank you so much, Sip. Thank you Cheers. for having me today. It's been a pleasure. <laughs>